Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Dr. Mirren Vesting, an emergency medicine specialist here in the UK. And in this episode today, we're going to be going through specific ECG changes that you should be looking for that most doctors tend to miss. And in this episode, we're going to be going through three ECG changes that you all should be recognizing, but most doctors tend to miss. And that's Wellen syndrome, Brugada syndrome, and posterior MI. So I'm going to be showing you ECGs of how to recognize these cases because these are the types of patients that walk in through the front door of the emergency department and most doctors see the ECG and actually miss the diagnosis because they don't know what they're looking for. Now these are cases that I have seen on a day-to-day -day basis and pick up on these types of patients and give them the correct treatment. So I'm here to teach you so that you can recognize them and you can do the best for your patient to keep them absolutely safe. So let's get into it. First is first, we're going to go through Wellen syndrome. I'm going to pop the ECG up here. Simply put, Wellen syndrome is a pattern of either deeply inverted T waves or biphasic T waves in V2 and V3. And this is highly specific for a critical stenosis of the left anterior descending coronary artery. And the most important feature to remember at this time is when you see this pattern, these patients tend to be pain free. So initially they've had pain, but now they are not in any pain. So when you are taking the history from them, that patient will not have pain, but they will have this pattern on the ECG and hence why it is missed. They also might have only marginally elevated cardiac enzymes, the troponin, and therefore it can get brushed off as nothing. And that's another reason why this diagnosis is missed and patients go through the system and they don't have the correct diagnosis made. But what happens to this patient because they've got a critical stenosis of the left anterior descending artery is that they are at such a high risk that in the next few days, they will go on to have a very extensive myocardial infarction. They will have a heart attack. These patients don't do well with medical management. So different medications that we give for other patients that have different types of heart attacks, these patients don't do well with medical management, meaning that they need to go to the cath lab and have invasive management done in order to unblock that vessel. So making the diagnosis early, discussing with the cardiologist and getting the patient to the cath lab is the most important thing that you could do for these types of patients. Now in 75% of cases of Wellen syndrome, you will see the deeply inverted T waves. In 25% of the cases, you will see the biphasic T wave. And the reason why that is, is the changes that happen when you have the blockage is that you start off with the biphasic T waves and then it leads on to having the deeply inverted T waves, hence why they are seen more often. And yes, you will see them in V2 and V3, but they can actually extend into V3, 4, 5 and 6. And you might have only an ST elevation, which is minimal, less than one millimeter. So it's technically not clinically significant, but in the context of Wellen syndrome, it's highly critical. And we'll go on to the next diagnosis, which is Brugada syndrome. Now Brugada syndrome is very important because you will find changes on the ECG that lead to these types of patients being at a very high risk of something called sudden cardiac death. In some other countries, it's known as sudden nocturnal unexpected death syndrome. In some countries, such as the Philippines, it's known as to rise and moan in sleep. In Japan, it's known as sudden and unexpectedly seized phenomenon. And in Thailand, it's known as death during sleep. These patients are at high risk of sudden death, even though they have a normal structural heart. The median age of death is only 41 years of age and this ECG is really the diagnostic ECG. There are other types of Brugada syndrome but they are not potentially diagnostic. This type of pattern that I'm showing is the only one which is potentially diagnostic. So it's often referred to as Brugada sign. And as you can see, there's a coving of the ST segment. So what you will see is an ST elevation of more than two millimeters in more than one of V1 to V3, which is then followed by a negative T wave. Now the ECG changes in these patients may come and go. So you may have a patient that actually has a normal ECG, but may have Brugada syndrome, but it doesn't show up on the heart tracing. At certain times, it may be uncovered by giving certain medications 
medications, if they've got a certain illness that comes about. But when there's a resolution, it disappears. So it can be actually very tricky to pick up on. And the only proven treatment for these types of patients is by implanting a device known as an ICD. And this stands for Implantable Cardioverter Defibrillator. Essentially what happens is, is that when the heart stops beating on its own accord due to Brugada syndrome, this device delivers an electric shock, which is what we would be doing if we were resuscitating someone who has a shockable rhythm. So this device gives the electrical shock needed to restart the heart so that it can function normally again. And the final one that we have is the posterior myocardial infarction. This is another diagnosis that is potentially notorious that people tend to miss in the emergency department, simply because it doesn't have the typical ECG changes that you would see for other types of heart attack. So the ECG I'm going to put up over here and see if you can see the finer detail. What you are looking for is this horizontal SD depression. And you will see these types of changes happening in V1, V2 and V3. You will see these tall broad R waves, this upright T waves and a dominant R wave in V2. Potentially you may also even see a mild ST elevation of one millimeter in AVR. What one can do is move leads four, five and six to the back to become posterior leads. So they are called V7, 8 and 9. And what that will reveal is in those leads you will now see a pattern of ST elevation. If you see that this helps confirm the diagnosis of a posterior MI. Again you will see this in the ECG that I am showing. So the first thing you must do with these types of patients is give them analgesia, nitrates, antiplatelets and the potential for anticoagulants but that depends on discussion with the cardiologist because these patients must be taken to the cath lab so that they can undo the blockage that's taking place that's causing the posterior myocardial infarction. I hope this topic was interesting. So remember these three different diagnoses when you're looking at ECGs because potentially you may be able to save someone's life and prevent them from deteriorating and someone else catching it later on or potentially even the patient getting sent home and something serious happening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope it was interesting and informative. And if you want to check out any of my other episodes such as fight scene trauma from movies then please check out my playlist and if you want to see things like the day in the life of a doctor in which you get to see me at work covering different cases put them up here as well for you to see and I look forward to seeing you all in the next episode remember stay safe look after yourselves and I'll see you all again thanks for watching